Looking ahead. Challenges and opportunities in the changing world. Welcome to Talking Economics, a podcast by the Center for Economic Research and Graduate Education, Economics Institute. In today's episode, we embark on a journey with our special guest, Professor Andreas Ortmann, to talk about behavioral economics, exploring the rise and challenges it faces now due to recent reports of fraudulent behavior in the field. Professor Ortmann is a professor of experimental and behavioral economics at the University of New South Wales Business School in Sydney, Australia. He was a professor and senior researcher at Sergi I from 2000 till 2009. He is known for his work on the experimental methodology in social sciences, heuristics, and coordination games. Welcome, Andreas. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, Andreas, today I would like to talk to you about the field of behavioral economics and uh, possibly use this as an example or an illustration of the challenges that we face in academia these days. So for the start, Can you tell us about uh, how behavioral economics started and shed some light on why it became so popular? Sure. Uh, Behavioral economics uh, started decades ago. Uh, Psychologist Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky, uh, the former recipient, ironically, with experimental economist extraordinaire Vernon Smith of the Nobel Prize in economics in 2002. Uh, They are often credited as having initiated uh, behavioral economics with a couple of influential papers in the 1970s. Economist Richard Thaler, who received the Nobel Prize in 2017, took up some of these ideas and propagated them. So what made it so popular? It became popular because of its promise to inject more psychological realism into economic models because Kahneman Tversky, to some extent Thaler, had the neck to come up with uh, anecdotes and unincentivized demonstrations that seemed to suggest that people were bumbling fools that needed all the help they could get. Not at all the coolly calculating machines that populated economic theory in the 70s and 80s, which is many decades back. Uh, the influence has been tremendous, uh, the influence of their work has been tremendous, There's literally thousands of studies that seem to suggest that uh, um, people are not as perfect as economic theory uh, often assumes. Yes, (laughs) looking uh, around ourselves, I think people are not perfect, but um, uh, let's let's go back to behavioral economics. Uh, So would you say that... um, well, what what's happening now? Yeah, fast, uh, fast uh, forward. Uh, what we observed now recently e- are several cases of uh, detected fro- fraudulent behavior. Would you say that this behavior uh, was somehow triggered or encouraged also by the fact that the field became so popular, and also that its uh, its findings are easily applicable to, for example, for policy for, for policy purposes? Well, that was, of course, <clears throat> uh, part of the promise that uh, behavioral economics um, suggested, or behavioral science more generally, that some of these insights could be used for policy interventions. So in a very famous and now maybe infamous uh, example, uh, Ariely and Gino were the co-authors, together with a couple of other people, of a famous paper in 2012 that suggested if people sign uh, a declaration, like a text declaration, at the top of the page, they would be more honest, they would report more honestly uh, about the true state of affairs. Now, this particular paper in 2012 um, had two lab experiments and one field experiment uh, Ariely was responsible for the field experiment and um, Gino was responsible for the lab experiments. Uh, it turns out, uh, as was discovered by uh, a trio of data detectives uh, that call themselves Data Colana, uh, that the field experiment data uh, were manipulated uh, towards the hypothesis and a couple of years later, it was also discovered by the same 
trio of data detectives that uh, the first lab study uh, was the data for the first lab study uh, were manipulated uh, again into the direction of um, the hypothesis that they sold. Now, the, the problem here is that um, for many, many years, people believed these results were for real, and many so-called behavioral insights units uh, tried to enhance the reliability of text declarations and whatnot by making people sign these documents at the top of the page. Um, we now know that these data were faked, and there's still some dispute about who faked them, but you know, the finger points uh, quite clearly to the uh, to two of the authors um, of this paper. And uh, the paper has now re been retract retracted twice, uh, first based on the dubiousness of the field data in 2020, and now also because of the dubiousness of the lab data in 2022. Um, practically, that means that literally probably millions of dollars were spent uh, on studies and on policy interventions that were for the birds, that uh, simply uh, could not possibly deliver what originally was promised they would deliver. And that's, of course, not ideal. You would like to have policy interventions based on reliable science. And it seems that this particular policy intervention uh, was not based on sound science. Uh, unfortunately, there's many, many other examples uh, that are very similar, follow a very similar pattern. You know, sexy results, uh, very promising results, uh, low-hanging fruit that, uh, policy, that behavioral insights units try to collect. Um, but, you know, apparently based on very questionable data. So what would you say are the reasons for all these uh, fraudulent behavior in science? Uh, what are, are there wrong incentives or what would you say are the main causes? Well, it's not sure that, um, you know, this is a problem across the sciences. You know, for example, from a large scale replication attempt in 2015, where the so-called Open Science Collaborative uh, tried to replicate 100 papers that uh, only one out of four papers in social psychology can be replicated, but that a much larger percentage can be replicated in, let's say, the cognitive psychology. And we know from some other uh, experiments and replication attempts that economics does reasonably well. We seem to be able to replicate about seven to ten, seven out of 10 uh, studies. So it's, it's not in general a problem, uh, I believe, of science, uh, although every science has to be concerned about replicability. Uh, it seems to be a particular problem of this ecology of behavioral scientists uh, that is centered around people like Ariely and Gino and uh, various of their co-authors. Uh, why is this? Well, these uh, folks work at business schools. Um, they uh, have obviously a lot of pressure on them to produce. And uh, it seems that some of them have decided that um, uh, cutting, corner, uh, cutting corners is uh, one way to go. Uh, it has certainly paid off quite handsomely for these folks in terms of uh, uh, quite remarkable salaries that the universities pay for them, but also in terms of TED Talks, in terms of books, in terms of uh, best-selling books, I should add, uh, and uh, you know, consulting contracts uh, and whatnot. So there's some clear-cut economic incentives, not surprisingly, that drive some of this. Mm, but uh, you said that they were pushed to publish. Uh, isn't this the, the same across, actually, the sciences? Isn't this uh, actually the, the trend here that it's either publish or perish, right? So uh, Yes, no, that's, that's why, of course, in, in, in principle, it's a problem everywhere. But it seems to be a, princ it seems to be a problem more in this particular uh, part of science, uh, the soft science, so to speak, of behavioral science. Uh, where you don't have, let's say, clear-cut theory, where you look at effects uh, of the kinds that I described earlier. Uh, that is, you know, if you sign something at the top of the paper, 
do you report more honestly? There is no theory here. There is no mechanism. There is, you know, uh, just a claim that's being tested sometimes or most often with uh, uh, underpowered, uh, in underpowered studies that is too few subjects, um, etc. So it's a question of methods, of uh, different methods in different areas of social sciences. And I would argue that methods in some areas like experimental economics uh, are sounder than methods in some other parts of social sciences. And of course, this whole ecology of behavioral science that tries to come up with the catchy uh, re uh, results of the kind that I discussed uh, seems to be particularly susceptible to these kind of uh, mischiefs. I'm happy that you mentioned experimental economics because um I think in, in, in it's quite widespread that these two are taken together, right? It's behavioral economics and experimental economics because the methods of experiments are used to test the behavioral insights, right? So you distinguish clearly that all these issues are linked to the behavioral economics, but they don't spill over to experimental? Or what is your take on that? Well, <clears throat> Originally, behavioral economics um, was an attempt to inject insights from psychology into economics, to make economic theories more realistic. Now, the problem here is that, uh, at least in some areas in psychology, uh, that's not true for all areas, but for some areas of psychology, the methods are uh, questionable at best. Uh, you talk about unincentivized studies, uh, the use of deception, uh, at least at the time when some of these studies were uh, produced, uh, was uh, still uh, quite strong. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the results were produced in ways that expert economists would not produce them. In expert economics, uh, we typically don't use uh, scenario studies that are unincentivized. We don't use um, uh, in general, unincentivized experiments uh, and whatnot. We use um, based on theories, uh, experimental setups, where the consequences of decisions in the lab, for example, matter to the participants, uh, which tends to uh, enhance truthful uh, reporting and you know less noisy reporting. Uh, we also don't use deception. So there's strong difference in the methods that experimental economists use and that behavioral economists use. And I should, I, I should uh, add, uh, not all behavioral economists um, use scenario studies and deception. Uh, there's a considerable part of behavioral economists who have moved towards um, uh, running experiments, it is very much in the tradition of experimental economics. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in the way work is being done in behavioral economics broadly construed. That's an important qualification because there's a lot of good stuff being done in behavioral economics by some behavioral economics, uh, in particular those uh, who have been trained in cognitive psychology uh, or in experimental economics. Uh, so the problem is, of course, that, that most people can't distinguish uh, what is good science and what is bad science. And so there's a lot of spillover effects. Um, and that's, of course, not so nice uh, because not only those people with questionable methods uh, get their reputations damaged, but um, all kinds of other people who do actually do sound science get their reputations damaged uh, at this point. And I guess that the spillover is for all the science in general, right? If you read in the papers that uh, these two people who became very famous uh, were just, uh, they, they became famous based on, on fraud, uh, this spills over and then the trust to the science as such is, is uh, violated or harmed. The question is, um, how come academia publishing has been around for many years and there are methods, there are mechanisms that, the, you know, you want to publish a paper, there are two referees who are reading the paper. So it seems that there are ways that the, the science is trying to prevent, uh, you know, uh, 
unsound science to to be published and to be popularized. How come this happened and uh, what's wrong with these mechanisms? Um, well, the concern about unsound science is uh, fairly recent. Um, uh, it really starts with a couple of papers in 2011 in psychology um, and uh, it has only been in the last few years that people have been more concerned about, let's say, the way you evaluate statistically results uh, that are being produced in the lab or the field. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it has taken quite a number of years uh, for people to wake up uh, to the fact that many results in uh, a number of areas in social sciences are not replicable. Uh, by the way, replicability is an issue also in other sciences, not just in the social sciences, but let's stick with behavioral economics and experimental economics mm -hmm. for the time being. Um, so it has only in the last uh, four, five, six years uh, become somewhat of a standard, for example, having to deposit uh, your data with a journal or some data uh, depository. Uh, that's, of course, a good thing. Uh, for example, this, uh, these folks, Ariely and Gino, uh, got ultimately ferreted out, and the question, the, the dubiousness of their studies uh, got found out once they posted the data. Um, so having data posted uh, should, be, uh, should be done on a regular basis. Uh, even though it's not always possible because you might deal with proprietary data and whatnot. But in many, many cases, it certainly is, and it should be done, and uh, journals should insist on this. And certainly as a journal where I'm a co-editor, Experimental Economics, we have done this for a number of years now, that we require people to post their data um, uh, in some public depository uh, for people uh, to replicate these data. And do you think that the journal also is obliged to check the data or should they trust the authors that this is something that... Well, different journals have uh, different policies. Um, um, you know, some journals uh, actually do check the data quite carefully. Uh, we don't check the data carefully. We simply make sure that uh, the data exist, uh, that they can be processed with uh, the programs um, that um, uh, the authors said uh, they use. And we do some quick checks, but uh, typically we leave uh, into data detectives outside of the journal uh, to, to you know, try to understand whether it's a problem or not. And that's, I think, perfectly fine, you know, um, Otherwise, it would be extremely costly, right? Even now, I guess it's a problem to find that FREs were. Well, I mean, you know, the the example of um, of Data Colada and the uh, 2012 study by Ariely, Gino, and a couple other people shows uh, that there's enough people out there who are willing to look into data for high visibility and high impact studies. And that's what you want, because it's kind of a latent threat, right, for a researcher. If they know the data get posted, and that they have to post the data, and that there will be people who might be interested in looking into it, that might already constrain them to quite some extent. So I'm not really concerned about the journals checking themselves, or that would, of course, be nice. But uh, the key thing is that data are available, that uh, interested folks uh, can go out and look into the data and, uh, you know, try to replicate the results that are being reported in the paper. There's, of course, various other ways. Uh, for example, a recent um, development is that uh, some journals have uh, started <coughs> pre-registered uh, reports um, and also pre-registered replication reports. And um, uh, in those kind of situations, uh, the authors uh, essentially write the paper um, and explain their analysis strategy without the results being known. And then uh, a journal can, for example, decide to accept a paper based on the design, the implementation, uh, and the analysis strategy. 
without the results being known at this point. That takes care of a well-known problem, uh, the well-known uh, drawer problem where null results typically end up. Null results not being very interesting uh, to most people. You want to have interesting positive results, uh, but that biases again uh, our understanding of what science really says or what the state of the world is. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is uh, on the side of the journals and publications. Um, what about the institutions? Can you maybe say more about how the universities can change the incentives for the authors or how they responded to their uh, to these two cases, so speak specifically Dan Ariely and, and Francesca Gino? Well, <clears throat> um, rumors uh, have been swirling around Ariely for uh, quite a while. Uh, Richard Thaler is a Nobel Prize laureate uh, of 2017 in economics uh, has uh, gone on record uh, that he has known for quite a while that Ariely is making stuff up. Um, and so it's kind of interesting that MIT uh, where Ariely first worked and uh, Duke uh, where he's currently working uh, seem not to have done any studies that were shared with the public at least, which is uh, deplorable uh, because it probably allowed him to go from MIT to Duke. And, uh, you know, now we're in yet another situation where we have questions about data in which he was involved. Um, Gino and Harvard is a different story. The Data Collada uh, Collective, uh, these three data detectives who are all professors at respectable uh, business schools, um, sent Harvard Business School apparently a couple of years back uh, a report in which they suggested that four of these studies that uh, Gino was responsible for um, were highly problematic um, and that the data was were tampered with and couldn't be relied on. And uh, Harvard Business School started a process that led to apparently a 1200 page report that confirmed the um, conjectures of the data collada guys uh, and essentially stood uh, Gino down at the beginning of the year uh, and uh, again, we don't know all the details. Lots of it uh, is being reported informally on all kinds of social media sites, but we don't know all the facts. The fact is that she's, she got stood down and uh, a few weeks ago, she actually filed a lawsuit um, for at least $25 million uh, against Harvard uh, and the data collect the data collada guys uh, because of procedural errors, because of alleged discrimination and because of alleged defamation. Now the courts will ultimately decide uh, uh, whether these accusations are correct or not. But of course that really puts um, uh, everyone who wants in good faith look at data that are somewhere deposited or notice, you know, you might get sued by someone who doesn't like your findings. Uh, and that is not a good thing to do. And it's um, certainly a good thing that uh, Harvard Business School has taken these uh, accusations serious and is uh, following up and followed up on them with a report and uh, with um, apparently personal consequences. Uh, I understand that um, Harvard now also tries to revoke the tenure for Gino. Uh, and those are, of course, the kind of steps um, that if indeed the accusation of uh, research misconduct as they stand right now are correct, should be done. Mm -hmm. Now, with these two prominent uh, cases, and kind of harming the the um, name of behavioral economics. Where do you see the future of this field? Well, I think it's um, <clears throat> uh, 
it's not just these two prominent people, there's a number of other people, right? I mean, you can go back a, a good decade to uh, Diedrich Stapel, who at this point has uh, almost uh, 60 papers uh, retracted. Uh, there's a number of other folks uh, in this area who also had papers retracted and were stood down and whatnot. Um, I think to the extent that people now have to face consequences, um, uh, it, it will have uh, a good effect on the way science is being done. As I said before, behavioral science or behavioral economics is not behavioral economics. There's good guys in behavioral economics and there's not so good guys in behavioral economics. And, um, uh, and unfortunately, those who work in behavioral economics uh, do serious work uh, and uh, who use sound methods get tainted to some extent by these folks who clearly cut corners and uh, you know produce results that, that we shouldn't rely on. Um, so I think it's kind of a cleaning process that will take, I fear, years to play out because once the courts get involved, that's what it takes. Um, but it's also important to uh, understand that there's widespread support, for example, of the data collada guys. Um, when this whole thing broke, um, a bunch of uh, uh, researchers started a GoFundMe page uh, with the goal of um, uh, building a defense fund for the data collada guys. Uh, the target was 250k, and these 250k were provided in a crowdsourced manner uh, within 24 hours uh, by more than 2,000 people who contributed. And uh, that's, uh, I think, indication of um, people being concerned about what happens, uh, people being concerned and finding it completely inappropriate uh, that. Uh, wealthy researchers try to litigate their way out of the trouble they got themselves into. So I think these developments uh, will be painful for some, they will be costly uh, for some, but in the end it can only help uh, science to become sounder, uh, behavioral science to become sounder than it uh, currently certainly is in certain quarters. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your insights and thank you for being with us here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.